Stand with me, church, all of you, if you will, today. Uh, we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 10 verses to you this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. These are the words of Paul. He says, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I'll go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Lord, we hear your word. Help us to apply this difficult but potent truth into our lives, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Last weekend, we began our new summer series called While I'm Waiting, and we, if you were here last week, you know we came in neck deep, man. We just got into this, into, into a topic that is so difficult to understand, and we were talking about this idea of what do you do in life when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you're up against a situation that has been what it's been for a while? It doesn't look like it's going to change. You've tried everything you know to do to fix it. And as you look now, you feel like you're out of weapons to attack the problem. And anything you do see that might be a possibility left has with itself even more difficulties. And so you just sit back and say, well, it is what it is. And I don't know what in the world I'm going to do about this. And we said last week the first thing we had to do was unmask the lies of the devil who said that when we face these impossible situations, it either means that God isn't there or God doesn't care. If you were here last weekend, you'll remember that we said those are lies and we got to get past those. In fact, we finished by saying out loud, God is there and God does care. That's how we closed out last week, and we said the very first thing that happens in our lives when we face these impossible situations that aren't going to change as best we can tell, we must submit to God's sovereignty and trust Him at the same time. We said you got to put those two together, submitting and trusting, and that's where we begin. Well, if we were in it neck deep last week, this weekend, we're just jumping in the deep end, and it's 12 feet, all right? Because where we're going to go now may, in some senses, even be a deeper place to go. But before it's all said and done, I believe it's going to be helpful to you. What Paul says here in this passage, some of you who have yet to become believers go, it's this kind of thing, and it makes me wonder if I really should ever become a Christian. This is crazy talk. I don't know what this guy is saying, but this sounds nuts. This is the kind of thing that those of us who have been in church a lot of years have heard so many times, kind of, yeah, 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 that's right. When I'm weak and I'm strong, yeah, I'm going to boast in weaknesses and all that stuff. And if you stop for a minute and listen to what you're saying, it means one of two things. One, either we've snapped and we have no idea what we're talking about. Or two, we have come to a very special place in our faith that trusts God even with the weaknesses of our lives. First things first, let, let's talk about what Paul's going through here and what he's been through. Did you know there's a passage where Paul lays out what I call his pedigree of pain? There's another passage where Paul says, let me tell you all that I've gone through. And so he lists this whole list, 15 or 20 things. I just grabbed five of them out of the middle, okay? Because I'd like you to recognize today just how much Paul has indeed and will suffer during the years that he is alive 
and preaching the gospel and living for Christ. And so what I've done is I've pulled out just five. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's Father's Day, so, you know, we all have funny things that our kids do. And a few years ago, we were riding down the road, and my kids know that I have the habit of just making up games when we're going down the road, and we'll just create these games, and we'll just play them. And so my, my two little girls said, Dad, we made up a game. Do you want to play? I was like, sure. They said, okay, it's called Would You Rather. I said, okay, that sounds like fun. I'm thinking they're going to say, would you rather stop for a bowl of ice cream or a brownie? You know, some good question like that, right? So I'm like, okay, let's play would you rather. And so they start, Candace goes first. She says, okay, Dad, would you rather die by being run over and impaled by a train or have a bucket of acid poured over your head and burn up to death? I don't like this game very much. Do I have to pick one? Is die in your sleep coming up as an option? You know what's going on here? So we played it. So this morning, I want to play Would You Rather with you, okay? Here's five things that Paul went through. You get to pick one, but listen, you have to pick it in the quantity that he went through. Let's put them up on the screen one at a time, if we will, Jeff. Here's some of the things Paul said that he went through in life. First one, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. 40 lashes, folks. He was whipped 39 times. Times five. Five times he'd been through his life. So you want this one, if you want the whipping, you have to go through it five times in your life. Here's the second one. Three times I was beaten with rods. All right, you'll have to only go through it three times, but I think rods are harder than whips last time I checked. So you can go with three times beaten for rod. The next one says, once I was stoned. All right, that is not a reference to drugs. All right, folks, just want to be clear. So you've already done that one. I'm good. You know, I lived through the 60s, but stop that talk. All right. No, what this means... And some of you are like, okay, well, I'm going to take this one because this only happened to Paul once. However, understand that you can go find this stoning, okay? And in this stoning, when it happens, they so thoroughly destroyed Paul that every person who was stoning him was convinced he was dead and left. That's how bad off that was. And, and, and the brothers of the faith came out and, and, and basically carried him back into town. All right, let's look at the fourth option for you. Three times I was shipwrecked. How many, how many of you want to go through the Titanic? Three times, okay. That'd be option number four. Option number five is I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And some of you are like, it's one thing to die. It would be another thing to spend 36 hours waiting for the sharks to come. All right. And so there are your options. We could play Would You Rather this morning. And the truth is, some of you are like, is there option number six that says, can I just pass? Right. I don't want any of those things. And these are the things that Paul has been through. Some of them, in addition to he says, you know, I've been chased and I've been in danger and I've done things that people have destroyed and all that. He goes on and on and on and on. But would you believe that of all those things that are in his pedigree of pain, when Paul comes and talks to God about the thing he wants him to take away, he doesn't say, God, don't ever let me be whipped again. God, don't ever let me be stoned again. God, don't ever let me be beaten again. He says, God, would you take away my thorn in the flesh? Now, this word thorn here is actually better translated steak. And I'm not talking about the kinds that some of you men are going to grill up today for Father's Day. We're talking about like a steak driven into him and twisted in the kind of pain that he goes through. And he says, God, if nothing else, would you just take that away from me? Many possibilities have suggested for what that steak in the flesh was. There are two that historians and biblical commentators believe probably rise to the top because we don't know for sure. The first one's physical, I'll suggest. The second one is not physical. The first physical one comes from the idea they say, well, it's a thorn in the flesh. So it's some kind of physical thing that he's going through. And it is believed that Paul had severe problem with eyesight. Now you're like, oh, it's all right. So he's got eye problems. Why, is, why does that bother Paul that much? Well, there's a couple things you need to know. One is it's believed that his problems were so severe that it was literally disfiguring to him. Have you ever, like, been talking to someone and, I don't know, they got a bad case of pink eye? Or talking to someone, they got something kind of disease going on in their eyes, and it's like hard to look at them. You know what I'm talking about? Or someone in their eyes are all, it's really hard to, to look at. I want you to imagine that God has called you to preach the gospel around the world, and people can't stand to look at you. I also want you to imagine that you're traveling the world in a day and age in which the way you get around is walking, and you can't see very well. Does that sound like a thorn in the flesh to you? The reason we believe possibly this is this is the first factor is a number of factors. First of all, we know that when when God actually reached Saul, who became Paul, do you remember how he did it? He blinded him. 
And so some say the beginning of Saul's eye trouble was that God blinded him. And when Ananias came and healed him, that God kind of did similar to what he did when he race, wrestled with Jacob in the Old Testament. You remember that story? And, and Jacob wins the match against God, if you will, but he goes away with a limp, right? And some say this was, in a sense, Paul's limp, that God had his eyes healed, but his eyes forever would have severe trouble. Other indicators that this is true is the fact that to the Galatians, Paul says, I know that some of you have actually said, you wish you could tear your eyes out and give them to me because you love me so much. An indicator of how bad his eyes were. And as he closes out that letter, he says, now I, Paul, this is from me, and to prove it, you can tell my signature. And the reason you know it's my signature is, look at the great big letters I use. Because he can't see very well. And some say this was this thorn in the flesh that, that Paul went through. Others suggest, no, the, the idea that he says that there's a messenger from Satan really gives it more of a personified feel. That the thorn in the flesh was actually an interaction with a particular person. It is known, it's strongly believed that there was a powerful adversary in Corinth that was tearing apart Paul's ministry. And Paul loved the church in Corinth. What's the longest letters you find in the Bible from Paul or to the Corinthians? He loves this church, but the church is struggling. And Paul goes back and invests himself in this church. And every time he does, as soon as he leaves, this other adversary shows up, destroys his work, tears it down. You know, this is Paul and, and just causes all kinds of trouble. And no matter what Paul did, he couldn't seem to shake himself of this person that was this thorn in the flesh and was destroying that which he had worked so hard to build. No matter what it is, there is no doubt here that there is tremendous angst on Paul's part and great desire for God to take it away. And in the midst of that, that helps us today because some of us today say, I'm dealing with a thorn in the flesh and oh, that God would take it away. Oh, that God would change that circumstance. Oh, that he would heal me. Oh, that he would solve this problem in my life. Let me show you how Paul helps us, if that's where you are today, while you're waiting. The first thing he says is this. Recognize, sometimes God gives the trouble. Now, no one wants to say amen in the room today, and I understand that. And I warned you we'd be in the deep end from the start. And this is the kind of thing someone would say, I don't like that. You know, I'm not sure about that theology. You know, but, but, but listen to me. Look what Paul says. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given, see the word there? Given me a thorn in the flesh. So there's some party out there interested in Paul not becoming conceited. And for that purpose, Paul's given a thorn in the flesh. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think the devil wants to keep Paul from becoming conceited? You can answer. No. The devil will be more than happy for Paul to be conceited because the Bible says God opposes the proud. So the devil will be more than happy to leave Paul in a position of pridefulness and conceit. So it's not the devil. No, who is it that doesn't want Paul to be conceited? God doesn't want Paul to be conceited. And on top of that, okay, go, looking back again at that word given, that word given there is not a word that's used in a negative sense. It's the same word given that we would use if we, we said, you know what, we had a birthday party for me yesterday and I was given some gifts. It's the same word given as if you would say, you know, it was Father's Day, and in the afternoon, I went golfing, and I hit all my balls in the water, and it's a good thing I was given an extra dozen by my wife so I could hit another dozen into the water. <laughs> Can I get an amen from an honest golfer in the room? <laughs> all right? This is the term that's being used. It's not the word dumped on me. It's not the word laid on me. It's this idea that somehow this has been given from the hand of God. You see, Paul says, the issue is, I actually could 
calculate and lay out for you all the things that I can boast about. In fact, if you want to read later today, go back earlier and Paul starts saying, hey, if someone wanted to boast, no, I'm not gonna, but if someone wanted to, let me show you the things I could boast about. I could tell you about, you know, what a great Pharisee I was and my family lineage and who I studied under and all the reasons that I'm better than you. He said, I could do all that. And then he says this, he says, and if none of those other ones impressed you, I could tell you about someone I know. <coughs> it, it's me, <laughs> he says. Who went to heaven and had Jesus whisper in my ears things he hasn't told anyone else. And that he doesn't plan on telling anybody else. But he told me. Paul says, I could boast about that. In fact, he says, it wouldn't even be inappropriately for, for me to boast about that because <laughs> that's so boastworthy. Folks, it'd be like, can you imagine being, you know, in, in the age of Paul and you're hanging out at like a, a theologian's gathering together? You know, and you're, all, you're all, all sitting there together and you're sipping your punch and eating whatever you eat at theologian gatherings in <laughs> AD 50. And you're just sitting there and... and and it happens everywhere. People in similar, you know, businesses and trades start trying to one-up each other. And the one guy's like, yeah, you know, the other day I preached 5,000 people. Disciples sang and 3,000 people came forward to just as I am. It was great. You know, and somebody else says, hey, listen, man. Peter, James, and John came to me the other day and asked me if I could straighten them out on their theology. And I taught them some stuff. You know, and Paul's just sitting back there, you know, snacking on his little snack letting them all talk themselves out. And then when they get to the end of it, he says, ha, that's not bad. He said, the other day God took me up to heaven and whispered secrets in my ears. <laughs> Top that. <laughs> and Paul says, if I were to boast about that, you couldn't even put me down for it because that is impressive. But then Paul says this, but I'm not going to boast about that. Because in reality, God doesn't want me to boast. God doesn't want me conceited. God wants me humbled. And because God wants that to happen, God has chosen to lay this thorn in my flesh in my life. Dear friends, I can tell you that there are some moments in my journey as a pastor that I have met godly men and women, older or younger, doesn't matter, who in conversation with them and the difficulty they're going through have said this kind of thing to me. Pastor, I have finally come to the place where I see what I'm going through as having come from the hand of God. And I told you last week, we can play with the allowed or caused or purposed. We can play with whatever term you want. But let's face it. If you believe he's a sovereign God in charge of the whole universe and you're going through something difficult, he could have kept you from it if he had so chosen. Am I right? But he didn't. And there are times, now careful, because I don't want you to walk out of here and say, everything bad that's ever happened to me, God just whammied me with it. That's not what I'm saying. There are times when we must see the difficulties of our lives as having come from the hand of God and with a purpose. Now, I need you to hear this, too, about purpose. We can screw ourselves into the ground trying to figure out the big existential purposes behind some great suffering we go through. But as a general rule, we're never going to figure that stuff out. When Paul says, I went through this stuff, but God had a purpose in it, he's not trying to say, well, when I was shipwrecked, I'm going to figure somehow out there God was doing this, 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 and this other people's lives. He's probably never going to see that or figure that stuff out. And in fact, be very careful how you ever talk that way about purpose with people. Very careful going to some mom who's, who's, whose daughter was killed by a, a drunk driver. And say to them, well, don't you see what happened? At the funeral, four people got saved. So there was a purpose in your daughter dying. Because when we draw those simple straight lines between those kind of things, someone goes home and says, oh, I see what you're saying. So God, God killed my girl so four people could get saved. Is that what you're saying? It's difficult to draw those kind of straight lines in existential ways. Now, sometimes in life we go through some suffering 
and, and we can see something that God brings out of it, and we can say, well, look, there's, there must have been some of God's purpose. You know, someone says, you know, man, my appendix ruptured, and I almost died, but they got me to the hospital, and my, my family gathered around me, and man, for a while I was out of work, and I, I lost income, and my, my wife and my kids were worried, but you know what happened in the middle of that? My son was visiting, you know, me in the hospital, and he met the nurse who was taking care of me, and they got married, and they had kids, and three of them are missionaries, and three of them are honest politicians. I mean, they're really pulling something off. <laughs> and now I see and I understand the purpose and why God would he did, did what he did. Listen, there may be times in life we get to see some of that bigger existential stuff, okay? It might happen. But hear me this morning. When Paul says, I see a purpose in the pain, he's not talking about out there in the great big cosmic scheme. I can figure out why God left me floating for a day and a half in the ocean. But here's what he does say. He says, in the thorn of the flesh, I do understand purpose in this sense. I have been allowed a moment of personal assessment to see how God wants me to respond to the difficulties in my life. That God is working something inside of me while I suffer. That God is doing something inside of me during the pain. Sometimes he will say, you know, suffering brings God glory. I think that's a misstatement. Because if we really thought it was that simple directive, suffering brings God glory, then we would believe God's some kind of masochist who hands out extra suffering so he can get extra glory. But I don't think suffering brings God glory. I think the way we respond to suffering in our lives can bring God glory. And that God is doing a work in us. And so, hear me, sometimes God gives the trouble, but it's pain with a purpose. Secondly, sometimes God doesn't take it away. Well, if you didn't like the first point, you hate the second one. Sometimes God doesn't take it away. You know, I was thinking the other day about when we go through hard times, and we want to think of a Bible character, who do we think of? Job, right? Think of Job. We're going through something called Job, you know? And and let's be honest, sometimes we pull the Job card way too quick. Ran out of gas on the way to work. <laughs> Got to work, coffee machine was broken, came home, my mower wouldn't start. Man, it's been a day like Job. <laughs> we may be significantly underestimating what Job went through. But, but you know, and, and in no way am I demeaning any, any of the pain or suffering we actually go through. I don't mean that, but... But sometimes when we, when we pull the Job card, I think one of the reasons we actually don't mind comparing ourselves to Job at times is because we like the end of Job's story, <laughs> right? Man, I'm going through stuff like Job is. Oh, God, as long as you make it work out like it did for Job, this might be all right. Because when it's all said and done, how does it work out for Job? He gets back everything he had and then some. The end of the story is so good. You want to skip through 30 chapters of poetry to get to it. But maybe there is no Job end to your story. Maybe God doesn't intend to take away from you your thorn in the flesh. And we pray, God, all I want to do is be done with this suffering. God, all I want to do is have this situation out of my life. God, all I want to do is be able to pay my bills without having to scrape together every dime, without having to search, search through all the seat cushions of, of my car and my neighbor's car when he's asleep. All right, not really. I don't mean that. God, I just want this to be over. How many times do I have to plead with you and beg you to change this? Well, let me tell you something today. If you've been pleading with God to take something out of your life, you're in good company. And I don't just mean Paul that we read about today. Let's go to Jesus. You know, Paul says, three times I pled with, with the Father to take it away. And as I was thinking about it, it reminded me of someone else who pled with God three times. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? It's the night before he's going to be crucified. He's in the garden. Look what it says, Matthew 26 Going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And if you look at that passage later, you'll see three times Jesus goes and prays this plea to God. God, take it away. God, take it away. God, take it away, if you will. And then right in this passage, we read, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. 
What's the next word? But, you know, three is the number of completeness. Paul's reference to here to, to pleading three times doesn't mean, you know, I prayed about it Sunday afternoon, and then I prayed about it Monday afternoon, and then I prayed about it Tuesday afternoon, and then I just didn't pray about it anymore. That's not what that means. We're talking about seasons of deep, heart-rending pleas before God. This is, God, this, this is back again. This is happening again. What are you going to do about this? God, I can't go on with all of this. The idea of three is the number of completeness. Three, a story has a beginning. It has a middle. It has an end. Three, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, complete and fully God in and of themselves with no need of anything else. Three is this represent representation of completeness and Paul says I prayed all I could pray about this but God said I'm not taking it away and God determines that no is a better answer than yes and this is probably where I lose some of you who are like this sermon just went off the rails <laughs> Because if you're here to tell me that the things I'm going through right now may never end, I'm not sure. I want to listen to the rest of the sermon. And if you're here to tell me that somehow that's going to be all right, I'm not sure I like that very much. I'm not sure I can ever be happy again. I'm not sure anything good can ever come of all of this. But here's where that but goes. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Here's the great news today. God always gives grace. He may not be bringing you relief, but he's bringing you grace. He's pouring out grace in your life. Paul is so enamored, so caught up now in the grace that God has provided him in the midst of this thorn in the flesh struggle that he actually says, are you ready for this? Now I found something worth bragging about. Can you imagine? Paul says, I could have bragged about the fact that I'd been pulled up to heaven. I'm not going to brag on that. Here's what I'm going to brag on. A God of grace who will carry me through something this difficult. That's the full argument. That's the full circle. He says, that I'll boast about. I will talk about how great God is in the midst of how great things aren't and how powerless I am. How much power you got in and of yourself? It's funny because all this talk about power and strength and often hits home with me because I'm not the biggest guy in the world. And there aren't many of you men who are looking at me today, looking at me, and, and from physical attributes thinking, strong. That guy's strong. He's strong. You might think he's strong-willed, strong-headed. You know, preach he's kind of strong sometimes. I remember a little girl swimming around in a pool. One of the kids in the, in the church one day wouldn't swim anywhere near me. And she said, I'm scared of you. <laughs> I said, why are you scared of me? Because you shout when you preach. <laughs> like, I'm not mad, honey. <laughs> not many of you look at me today and think strong, but there are some people in this world that look at me and think I'm very strong. My little girls. My kids think I'm strong. In fact, the other night, this is the second time this has happened. Some of you can remember a similar story, but the, just the other night, um, one of my kids were playing all of us this YouTube video of this of this woman. She's the she's the stunt double for Supergirl, and uh, she was on American Ninja Turtle or whatever that show is there, whatever that show is called. I don't remember, but and and she did the whole course. I mean, it was beast. When she was done, I was just, we were all just like, wow, that's just amazing, the strength she has. She's just so strong. And we got done, and, and my girls looked at me, and they said, Dad, you should go on that. You could do that. <laughs> I didn't tell them I can't. It's <laughs> my kids. It's okay for kids to think that about their dad. Come on, dads. It's okay for kids to think that way about their dads. Because you know what? I may not look strong to anybody else in the world, but when my kids look up at their father, they see a dad who can get the lid off the peanut butter jar when they can't. 
They see a dad who can carry two suitcases at once that they can't carry one of. They see a dad who they can come to when they feel weak and they feel powerless and they feel afraid and they feel uncertain and they'll find a daddy who's strong. And let me tell you something today. Paul says, I know strong when I see it. And it ain't seeing it in the mirror. I know strong when I look at my heavenly father. That's when I see strong. And that's what I'm going to brag about. And Paul says, Not only am I going to brag about it, man, are you ready for this? I'm therefore going to rejoice in it. I don't think any of us ever comes to the place where rejoicing in it means, thank you, God, that horrible things happen in my life, but I think rejoicing it says, thank you, God, that somehow in the midst of it all, you give me grace. And that somehow you are seen in my life though I am going through stuff that I wouldn't wish on anybody. Look what Paul says. I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, I, what's the word? Delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Every time Paul couldn't read the page in front of him that he had written, every time Paul thought about that man in Corinth that was working hard to fight against everything he'd done, it just drew him one more time to fall on his knees and to call on the one that he knew was truly strong because he just wasn't going to find that strength in and of himself. And Paul knew this, that God at work in him has the power of the one who raised Christ from the dead. And so Paul says, I have perspective I've never had before because of what I've been through. Dear friends, I want to tell you something. I don't wish on you anything difficult you're facing right now, but this I know. God has a purpose in his pain and he's working in that in ways that he couldn't pull it off any other way in your life. And as you come through it, you will have a perspective like you've never had before. If you've never been to the place where you didn't know where your next meal is coming from, where you were uncertain where where your next food was, that your cupboards were completely empty. And by the way, I've been there, completely empty cupboards. But if you've never been there, You've never understood the rejoicing that one bag of potatoes and a half pound of ground beef can bring. But when you've been through it, you're so much more grateful all of a sudden. If you've never been really sick, then you can't appreciate what it's like to wake up and have a good day and be strong enough to go out and just enjoy the day. But if you've been truly sick, oh, you have a perspective on it. It changes. If you've never been to the place where you didn't have two dimes to rub together to do something you would like to do, then you've never been to the place yet where you appreciate what it means to have enough to actually give some away to someone else so they can do something they would like to do. If you've never had your heart broken, you can't understand just how thankful you can be when someone really loves you. Maybe God's given you some perspectives as he's working in your life of who's strong and who's weak and of how in the midst of all this you can rejoice in what he's going to do even as you suffer through it. I want us to bow our heads together as we close this morning.